welcome to Classics Confidential. This week I'm in Cambridge talking to Helen Rush, who is a PhD student here in the Faculty of Classics. And she's working on a PhD on the topic of um, the appropriation of Sparta in German elite education. What period exactly are you looking at? Um, I'm looking at, well, I've got two case studies for my PhD which are the Prussian cadet schools um, from 1818 to 1920. Um, they were abolished with the Treaty of Versailles. And then um, the Napolas, or Nationalpolitische Erziehungsanstalten, which were a type of elite school during the Third Reich, so 1933 to 1945. How did you get into that topic? Um, it's quite weird in a way, random you might say. Um, when I was looking for a topic for my MPhil, um, I happened to find this book of a TV series which my mother had bought. The series was called Hitler's Children. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking for it. And I found this um, passage from the Reich Education Minister, Bernhard Rust, saying, um, we want all our young people to be brought up as Spartans and, you know, if anyone who doesn't want to join our Spartan community, you know, they can get lost sort of thing. And I thought, hmm, this sounds interesting. I wonder if there's anything more like this. And I found there was, and I thought, hmm, okay, I could do my MPhil thesis on Sparta and German education or something. Um, obviously, that's a really huge topic. But um, I happened to find on the internet this textbook from a type of school called the Adolf Hitler Schools, and they're another type of Nazi elite school. And it was called um, Sparta, the Life Struggle of an Aryan Master Race. Wow, um, so this was a history textbook, yeah. was it, that was used to teach yeah. about antiquity in those Adolf Yeah, Hitler. and it was specifically on Sparta. And um, I basically did a case study about, one, how um, it tried to sort of get the Adolf Hitler pu school pupils to identify with Spartan boys, Spartan youths, and also how it sort of systematically distorted um, Spartan history to serve Nazi ideological propaganda, basically. Wow. Um, so, yeah. so can you tell us a bit more about that? What, you know, what was it about Sparta that made it such an attractive parallel for, for this kind of school? Yeah, I think um, there are a number of reasons. Firstly, the sort of great emphasis on militarism, um, which they saw in Spartan society. I know Steve Hawkinson might disagree, but that's what they thought. He did an interview anyway. for us a few months ago. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I had to look at that. Um, and so, you know, you want your people to conquer the, the world and, you know, Spartan unconquerable militarism is a good parallel of being able to, um, you know, survive without any food and, you know, wearing hardly anything. You know, you want to promote this sort of spirit of toughness um, and resilience and you get sort of, there are even pictures of people at some of the schools running, doing cross-country running barefoot. Wow. And that's also something, I don't know if there's a direct causal link, but you find it in the sources on Sparta, right. like Plutarch's right. Lycanus or Xenophon. Um, then you have, oh, I guess the biggest link actually is the racial one, because basically the Nazis were convinced that they were the descendants of the ancient Greeks because they were pure Aryans. Right. So they saw the Spartans as the most Aryan of the Greek races because they were Dorians. And you get this link in um, earlier thought about, um, you know, the Doric race being sort of um, linked with, with Nordic. Right, race. right. Um, sort of Hans Gunther brings it up quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, and also sort of earlier 20th century people, it goes back to Karl Ottfried Miller, I think, mm -hmm. originally. Um, mm. So there's the, the sort of idea of a kind of blood link 
to Sparta, yeah. as well as the kind of militaristic ideals. Yes, and then the third most important thing I should think is the idea of community, everyone living in this community, serving the community, anti-individualistic, mm -hmm. um, self-sacrifice in battle for the fatherland being seen as the ultimate good and the ultimate goal. And of course a lot of the people at these schools went on to die for the Führer or whatever yes. in, in the Second World War and you know you can think you know maybe some of them did die thinking of Leonidas and yes. certainly Hitler spoke about Leonidas in the last days in the bunker saying yes. you know a, a worthy defeat will be remembered as an example and yes. stuff. How so. interesting. So um, as well as looking at uh, textbooks from the era um, how else are you going about doing your research? Um, well, for the research for my PhD that I've been doing, um, I've actually corresponded with and even in some cases interviewed and talked to a number of ex-pupils from the Napolis, wow. Um and they're mostly in their 80s now. Um, they were sort of out on average 15 or 16 um, in 1945. Um, so, so that's been sort of bizarre in some ways, but really amazing. Yeah, it's and quite unusual for a classicist to do that kind of <laughs> to be able to a living. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, does that raise particular challenges that that way of working? Um, it can do. I mean, obviously, um, the schools in some ways they're a bit of a taboo subject, and in in German media and. German scholarship to some extent, there can be a sort of demonisation and there are some pupils who are the ex-pupils of the schools who simply, you know, they, they kept it secret for a long time because it might have affected their careers if anyone had known that they'd been to a, mm -hmm. a Nazi elite school. And um, so, and you get a whole range of sort of reactions, some people just don't want to think about it anymore. Um, some people sort of um, want to very much emphasise the good things and say that it wasn't all bad and others um, say, well, you know, there were a lot of terrible things that happened and we were being educated um, for the Nazi regime and to die a hero's death mm. and stuff. Mm. Um, and obviously all the schools had slightly different ethos. Um, mm. So it's hard to make blanket statements, but no, for sure. Um, yeah. And and what kind of insight have they have these ex pupils given you into well, particularly the, the use of Sparta, the idealisation of Sparta? Um, well, there's one instance which which is really amazing. Um, this uh, guy that I wrote to, he could actually remember verbatim or almost. Um, a text which his class had been made to learn in the winter holiday of 1943 to 44. And the beginning of this text was um, a poem of Tertius translated into German. Um, and then the rest of it was sort of saying about, you know, um, how important Sparta was, but sort of more like the textbooks mm -hmm. um, material. And this guy, when I said, oh, you know, did you know that this was a poem by Tertius? He was like, oh, I never heard of Tertius. He just thought, uh, oh, well, you know, our teacher probably didn't write it, yeah. but maybe it came out of the textbook. And he could remember that, that they'd all been made to learn. And I found that really fascinating. That's incredible. Um, and, I mean, I'm quite interested in how far this is something that was, um, you know, this use of Sparta was um, sort of restricted to the educational context, or was it evident more widely in sort of culture, propaganda? Yeah. Right. I mean, I think this is something that I want to do more work on, but I think it was definitely quite widespread. There's um, evidence that Hitler was um, actually quite keen on Sparta and called her the sort of 
the clearest racial state in history and sort of implied that um, Germany should follow Spartan eugenic policies or oh, whatever. Yes, right. um, and you get, obviously, the Reich Education Minister is another example. In fact, um, one guy from one of these schools said that he remembered um, that Rust had come to visit their school and he had to report the class to him, so he was standing outside the door waiting for him. And Rust asked him, you know, how he was and how your father is or whatever. Yeah. And he said, oh, my father died um, in a car accident in Rostock on active service because mm. he was an SS officer, I think. Um, and Rust said, very good, my boy. In Sparta too, um, boys had to take the place of their fathers or something. Wow, wow. So this is just a personal anecdote, yeah. again, that which also raises to the conscious how, you know, how Rus was thinking about it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> um, and there are other people, like the agriculture minister, Richard Walter Dari, um, he sort of saw Sparta as a model for um, dividing land into um, lots, I think there was a law that was made where, which he sort of wanted to base on Sparta. Um, oh, so it sounds like it really was, it permeated that I think it did much quite, more. yeah, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And so your, your interviewees, uh, you're gathering your, some of your source material from, what, what do they think about what, what you're doing? Um, it's, it's really interesting actually. Um, a lot of them are sort of really pleased that anyone's interested in writing something about the Nakulas um, that's sort of objective because they feel that in, in German historiography and in the media there are these, these problems where they're just called sort of, um, you know, cadets of the devil or whatever. Yes. And there was a film which sort of portrayed um, pupils from the school sort of hunting down um, prisoners of war and such stuff that would never have actually happened and that was called Napola, um, Elite für den Führer or, or mm. something. And has um, that been quite influential in how people see the Napola? I think certainly on the younger generation there are people mm. who just believe that that's true because it was in the film so that must right. have been what it was like so I think... And when you say it could never have happened is that because of chronologically the dates don't work out? Um, so? Just because, well, partly sort of um, the areas that they were, and, and partly because there just isn't any evidence in any of the archives, mm. or, um, and even if you discount the eyewitness evidence, which mm. um, you might say no one would, would admit that this had happened, but there's just nothing to suggest that it ever could have okay. happened, and they didn't sort of go around carrying guns and, and yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So your your work is sort of adding another dimension to kind of, you know, understandings of, of the school and the curriculum. Yeah, and I'd say so. That it, it aims to be both important for classical reception and just for our understanding of, mm -hmm. of German elite education or education in Nazi Germany, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, hopefully. That was amazing. So are you presenting your work to classicists and to historians of that period? Yeah, um, I sort of, obviously a lot of classical conferences or whatever don't necessarily have very much outlet for for reception or you know it's very sort of specifically you know the gaze of late antiquity yeah. so I just if I see anything that I might be able to fit I mean I even presented at the British Society for Sports History <laughs> annual conference wow, yeah. about sort of the Spartan sporting paradigm in the elite schools of the third right <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of so, course, because there was the, the Olympics in Germany, was it 1936? Yeah. Right? Yeah, the, the Olympics as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you also get um, a lot of stuff about Olympia as well. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, I've not been working on that, but yeah, I yeah, think yeah. other people probably have. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, that's, that's really, you know, incredibly interesting and I suppose in some ways quite a difficult topic but yeah um, it, it has its moments yeah. certainly oh well thank you very much for, for telling us about that oh, and thank good luck with the rest of the rest of the PhD thank you <laughs>